Well, first of all, thank you so much for giving you uh, your time up for, for us here on uh, allaboutbodylanguage.com. I'm very grateful and very appreciative uh, of speaking to us. No problem. Fantastic. So I've got a couple of questions for you, if, um, if you don't mind. No, please go right ahead. Fantastic. The first one is all about you, your book um, with uh, Ms. Holiness Adali Lama. About, so that, are there any like similarities between uh, your research on emotions and, and his teachings on Buddhism? Are there any similarities there? Well, that's, of course, what we explored. And the book is really not a normal type of book. That is, it's not text. It's a conversation. Yeah. It's the actual conversation and dialogue between the two of us as we searched for new ground in understanding the nature of emotion. And Tibetan Buddhism uh, does not take for granted anything we do. Yes. And I don't take for granted anything they do. So it was a very interesting conversation. We spoke uh, at the time the book was published. We had uh, it covered 40 hours of conversation. Uh, since then, we've met for another 10 or 15 hours to continue the exploration. And we did come up with some new ideas that neither one of us had thought of previously. It was a very intense conversation. And the title of the book reflects one of those common grounds that the key to improving your emotional life is to introduce awareness, the sort of flashlight of consciousness into the process of emotion. Now, emotions evolved for dealing with emergency situations like the saber-toothed tiger. Uh, the modern equivalent of that is the car on the freeway that's verging into your lane, where you have to suddenly, without thought, without the consciousness uh, of consideration, you have to respond, and sometimes in very complex ways, but all without thinking, all without considering. Now, that's great for emergency situations. It's not always so good for the kinds of emotional interactions we have with our uh, friends, our spouses, our children, or our clients, where sometimes we respond as if there is an emergency when there isn't. Yes. And, some, and we don't, if we want to exercise choice about whether to engage and how to engage emotionally, we have to be aware of when an emotion is beginning to arise, or at least be aware when we start to act emotionally. Very often we're not. It isn't until afterwards that we realize we've just been in an emotional bout. I'm so frustrated with the telephone system at my office that in exasperation, I said to my uh, assistant, I'm bringing in a wire, wire clipper and I'm going to clip the wires of all the telephones. Well, of course, that's a stupid thing to say, but I was in the grip of an emotion and I wasn't even, I heard what I said, but I didn't realize or consider why I was saying it. Yes. Wow, fantastic. So in regards to your research on uh, facial expressions, what would you say has been the biggest significant development in this field since the, the 1960s? What would, you, what would you consider the next big development? Well, there really are two, and one led to the other. The first was settling the argument between Margaret Mead, who said that expressions are completely determined by culture so that a smile won't mean anything related to enjoyment in other cultures, only our own. Yeah. And Charles Darwin, who, uh, your countryman, who, who in 1872 wrote a brilliant book called The Expression of Emotion in Man and Animals, in which he asserted just the opposite. Yes. Now, neither one of them had evidence. And when I entered the fray in 1965, 66, I didn't really care who was right. I just wanted to see if I could settle the matter while there was still time to do so. Yes. And a crucial study... Uh, which I just narrowly was able to do before it became impossible to do such research, was to find a totally isolated people uh, who had never been exposed to outsiders or the media. And I found such people in the highlands of New Guinea, and I found that their emotional expressions 
were the same as you'd see anywhere else. Although there are different rules about the management of expression, the expression is the same for at least six and perhaps seven emotions are universal to our species, and four or five of them we can identify in other primates. So that was the first big uh, issue, and it sort of fit very well with the work that came a decade later showing the importance of understanding the brain in, in examining behavior. The second thing was that, that to develop a, a tool for actually measuring and describing anything the face can do. Up until uh, we published the Facial Action Coding System, FACS is the acronym, in 1978, there was no way to answer the question of how many different expressions can a human being make? Yeah. How many of them are relevant to emotion? Can I be absolutely certain that two people are making the same expression because it appears somewhat differently because of differences in their facial features? I mean, the face is primarily an identity signal system that allows us to tell one person from another. And so we each look different. Very rarely in life does someone come up to you and identify you by the wrong name because they think you're someone else. That may happen once in a lifetime. So we have very different facial features. But on, those, on that stage, the expressions, these universal expressions are played out but appear slightly different because of differences in wrinkles, fatty deposits, skin color, mm -hmm. shape of the features, etc. And the facial action coding system allows for the first time precise description and measurement. And now there are hundreds of scientists around the world using this same tool uh, to measure facial movement. Mm -hmm. It's the equivalent of the microscope uh, to looking at... Uh, cells, what the facial action coding system allows you to do for the first time with the face. So those are the two big things, one in the 60s and one in the 70s, that really revolutionized not just our understanding of expression, but our understanding of emotion itself, because the face still is the best window we have on what's happening emotionally. Yes. So in regards to facial expressions, how long would you say the average person takes to become prolific in detecting microexpressions? Well, we've tested over 15,000 people in every walk of life, and 99% of them just don't see microexpressions. Microexpressions are the product of concealment, yes. and they are very fast, about a 25th of a second. We developed a tool called the Microexpression Training Tool, uh, which is on our website, which takes about an hour. And about 100,000 people to date have used that tool online and have learned how to see microexpressions. And once you can see them, uh, you've opened your eyes um, to what's being concealed from you and your ability to spot normal expressions is enormously increased. And most people find it fun. It's set up uh, really so that uh, it's easy to do. And we have just are coming out with a new version of it that teaches you how to recognize microexpressions when you only have a profile view. Because yeah. if you're not conducting a one-on-one -on -one conversation, you very often in a conference only see the profile of someone. Uh, that's It's also relevant to surveillance. And it's a different set of skills to recognize these same emotions when you only have a profile view of the person. Yes. So in relation to your facial expression background, how important would you say was your uh, mentoring from Sylvan Tompkins throughout this? Was he, was he, would you consider him to be the most uh, prolific facial reader of all time? Well, of course, I don't. I never had the opportunity, except in my dreams, to meet Charles Darwin. Yeah. So I could certainly say in the 20th century, I believe it was Tompkins who was most sensitive to and most interested in the face. And it was 
Sylvan Tompkins, who got me interested in the face because I was able, he was able to show me by using slow motion and stop motion uh, cameras that I had, he was able to show me some of the information in the face. And I thought, if Tompkins can see it, I should be able to develop a scientific tool so that anyone could measure what Tompkins was seeing. So he was, although he was the inspiration for the cross-cultural work, he certainly was eager to see me do that. He was a strong advocate of the Darwinian view. Um, the I, of course, when I started out, I didn't know whether he was right or whether he was wrong. I just knew I wanted to try to discover uh, what the facts were. But then when I decided to try to develop a tool, the facial action coding system, Sylvan told me it's so complex, you'll, you're going to get lost, you'll never succeed. And of course, he turned out to be wrong. We did succeed, and he was very pleased about that. His theory about how the face showed emotion, maybe I should put it differently, his theory about what triggers emotions has turned out not to be correct. But certainly when in the middle of 1960s, he was one of only two or three people in the world who thought it was more than a waste of time to look at facial expression. Mm -hmm. So is it true the story behind when um, I've heard little stories about him? He was able to read facially the facial expressions of uh, wanted criminals, and he was able to predict what kind of crim the crime they've been involved in. Is that true? Or I don't know whether it's true. I know he made that claim. Yes. But I was never able to get his cooperation to actually test that rigorously. Uh, it wouldn't be hard to test, but it's never been tested, and uh, Tompkins is no longer alive. Mm -hmm. So we don't know whether that's possible. And uh, I have not, although I do a lot of work with law enforcement, I don't use mug shots. No. I think that they're likely, in my work, you have to see the expression, which is movement. You have to see the change in the face from one appearance to another, often in microseconds or sometimes in a couple of seconds. But without the movement, it's very hard to get precise measurement. Yes. So, so in relation to facial expressions and especially micro expressions, the, the TV show Lie to Me was extremely popular, not just here in Great Britain, but all over the world. And um, I, I saw your blog that you were writing in conjunction with every episode. Um, and you were talking about um, when the, the show engages in things like poetic license. Um, can you give us a couple of examples of where um, poetic license happened in the, in the show Lie to Me? Well, I reviewed every script three weeks before they shot it, yes. and I gave them feedback, and I often gave them video examples of how to have things performed, but they didn't always follow it, because sometimes the, the what they were saying they thought was just too sweet to give up. So yes. in the very first show, um, they make the remark that people lie, uh, Dr. Lightman, the so-called scientist who is supposedly based on me, yes. is a, says that people lie 12 times uh, an hour. Uh, well, I told him, that's we have no way to know how often people lie. Yeah. You can't ask people, how often do you lie and expect they're going to, if they know, they're going to give you a truthful answer. Yes. And of course, we're not always aware of when we are lying. Some lies become habitual. So unless you had a invisible cloak and you could follow people around, you don't know. the. But they were they knew it had no scientific basis, but they presented it as if it did.